I'm Chris Boyd. Up next on Think, a public official responsible for keeping elections secure got fed up with critics constantly warning about hacking, so she took a bold step. She asked them to reinvent the way Americans vote. We'll spend this hour with journalist Benjamin Wofford, who wrote recently for Wired about the confluence of groundbreaking new computer encryption methods and growing awareness of the vulnerability of commercially available voting machines. We'll hear how election guard technology could revolutionize the way we cast and tally ballots, and also why it is not coming soon to a polling place near you. Our conversation starts after a short break. Funding for Think comes from TCU, where faculty do research for the greater good, like Professor Dean Williams, who uses genetic mapping to help save the horned lizard from extinction. TCU, lead on. Funding for Think comes from the University of Texas at Dallas, celebrating 50 years and ranked first among Texas public universities for value by Forbes. More information at utdallas.edu slash bright. UT Dallas, moving at the speed of bright. A lot of us started worrying about election security after 2016, when reports surfaced that Russian operatives had impersonated ordinary Americans to influence the way we voted. Later, we learned about evidence that Russian hackers had found their way into election computer systems in some parts of the country. U.S. intelligence experts found no evidence of actual vote tampering, but the knowledge that it could have happened is really upsetting. Computer scientists have been sounding the alarm about this for a long time, to the annoyance of elections administrators in many parts of the U.S. who had limited limited options and budgets for shoring up their defenses. But then one county clerk turned the tables on her critics at a national conference in San Francisco. Okay, she said. She agreed this was a serious threat. And then she challenged them to build her a solution. From KERA in Dallas, this is Think. I'm Chris Boyd. This might have gone down as just a rhetorical exercise, an acknowledgement that, yes, election software is vulnerable, accompanied by a massive shoulder shrug that said, yeah, but nothing can really be done about it. But Dana de Beauvoir happened to issue her call for help as computer scientists were exploring the potential of a revolutionary new kind of encryption. And some leading thinkers had realized it could be used to build a voting system that was at once entirely anonymous and offered voters a paper trail to prove their ballot was counted accurately. Journalist Benjamin Wofford is here to tell us what happened. He's a contributor at Wired, and his recent article for the site is called A Texas County Clerk's Bold Crusade to Transform How We Vote. Ben, welcome to Think. Hi, Chris. Great to be here. Okay, so tell us about the concerns that computer scientists had raised about direct recording electronic voting machines, which folks in the industry call DREs. Right. So this story starts in many ways after Bush v. Gore in the recount crisis um, in 2000. And we all remember hanging chads and uh, the uh, uh, election administrators in Florida, uh, you know, examining the ballots with magnifying glasses. And so in the aftermath of that debacle, Congress passes a law called the Help America Vote Act, sometimes called HAVA. And it infused billions of dollars of uh, national uh, federal government money to the states to modernize their voting equipment from these punch ballot cards that uh, were on offer, for instance, in Florida, to an electronic voting uh, system that would basically instantiate a regime of these uh, digital voting machines. And the most popular voting machines are the ones that you just named called DREs. And DREs were um, uh, good in theory, uh, but as soon as they came out of the box, so to speak, uh, this infantry of computer scientists sort of appeared over the hill and immediately started assailing these machines for security vulnerabilities. And the reason for these vulnerabilities basically boiled down to uh, uh, a few key things. One was that the private sector that were uh, taking these state and government contracts to build these electronic voting machines were often very small and they were often very new. You know, it's not unlike when the government decided to go to war in Iraq you know, you had, uh, uh, you know, a number of government contractors sort of playing Ride of the Valkyries while they went off to, um, you know, make a good profit um, in the uh, achievement of some government goal. Uh, 
the problem was that in addition to these private companies um, being small and inexperienced, they were also very um, uh, you know, non-transparent. Um, there was a culture in computer science about building um, secure software and firmware that says you want your code to be open source, right? You want your code to be, um, uh, you know, to look under the hood at it to make sure that it doesn't have, you know, obvious weaknesses or vulnerabilities. For this reason, the Pentagon actually has hackathons where they invite, you know, so-called white hat hackers to sort of kick the tires and look at the code on everything from, uh, you know, so the software that runs F-16 fighter planes to um, you know, the cloud computer servers. And so the, these small companies that were manufacturing voting, voting machines didn't do that. And so that's a long way of saying the bottom line is before long, within about four or five years of most states, in fact, all 50 states had these DRE voting machines, there were big problems that were discovered in a series of white papers. These computer scientists found, you know, encryption codes of a, B, C, D, or E, you know, that was the password on some of these machines. You know, they found machines that didn't have, um, you know, the memory cards soldered in, into place. They could be removed. There was one famous instance where 40,000 lines of code were haphazardly left on websites. So um, these were companies that didn't have a lot of in incentives or experience in uh, protecting, um, you know, their election technology, uh, you know, like the critical infrastructure uh, it was. And it left both the computer scientists feeling frustrated and oftentimes the election administrators who ran, uh, you know, the local election in your county or your precinct, those are the actual folks who put on the elections in your uh, elementary school gymnasium, also feeling frustrated. If not for the problematic technology, these voting machines more often than not worked fine, but for the lack of trust that problematic technology could instantiate in the public because they were taking so much criticism um, from the computer scientists and technology sectors. And they were being criticized themselves, the county elections administrators, rather, the, I mean, a lot of it didn't filter back to the companies that made this stuff. And, and it sounds like the administrators didn't have a lot of other choices. There just wasn't much else on the market. Right. So if you're a small lo local election administrator, for the last 20 years, it's sort of been damned if you do and damned if you don't. Um, you know, the key thing to remember is an election is this incredibly delicate thing. You know, it's like, um, you know, Tinkerbell, we all have to sort of believe. And if we all clap and believe, the election can go well. But the key ingredient really is trust. And if you don't have trust in the basic protocol of voting, you don't really have an election at all. So these election clerks, who, by the way, are, are just heroic. I mean, if you know an election clerk, you know, salute them, thank them. They are the white blood cells of democracy. They have one of the most thankless jobs in America. They're trained to run elections in crisis situations. You know, there are uh, local clerks who are trained to run elections during hurricanes, during nuclear disasters. Um, they are unbelievably focused at having a competent election, which makes uh, claims going on right now in the 2020 election that it could be rigged um, uh, sort of all the more staggering. And we'll get to that in a minute, I'm sure. But the main point here is that election clerks were hamstrung by this tiny, tiny insular private sector that manufactures these voting machines. There's not anywhere else you can go because the regulations around how a state, like the state of Texas, for instance, uh, votes, even in you know, traditionally uh, you know, more libertarian or low regulation states, for instance, the way that we think of Texas, when it comes to elections, state regulations and county regulations are in, you know, uh, incredibly thorough, they're sometimes Byzantine, and they're also unique. So it's often said that, you know, we don't really have one presidential election in 2020. We really have something closer to 10,000 because that's the number of individual jurisdictions that, you know, run, conduct and then certify uh, the elections that then get reported to the state that are verified for the secretary of state. So the bottom line is if you're a, a small town clerk with virtually no budget, you know, to go buy, you know, fancy Pentagon grade technology that you can run your elections on, not only could you not afford that technology, it probably wouldn't be legal. You have a choice of three companies, um, not so different in the way that most Americans, if they want to buy a, a, a flight from, you know, Austin to San Francisco, they're really choosing between three airlines. <laughs> Election administrators had the same choice, and none of them were really particularly good. 
So this woman, Dana de Beauvoir, is county clerk of Travis County, Texas, which is the county that encompasses the city of Austin. This thorn in her side was a computer science professor at Rice University, this guy Dan Wallach. What what kinds of interactions had they had? Right. So it, it, um, the clerk of Travis County, Dana de Beauvoir, was taking incoming from computer scientists, and this was happening all over the country. And her biggest critic was a computer scientist named Dan Wallach at Rice. And um, their interactions were, uh, you know, polite and and sort of respectful, but fierce, right? And, and their clash perfectly captured what was going on around the country. Dan uh, was critical of the machines that Travis County and Austin had purchased, which were DREs. Uh, They were a model called the E-Slate, and they were used in dozens and dozens of other states. And uh, this was a model of machine that, you know, the uh, source code, you know, wasn't viewable by, um, you know, a a red team that could go and look for vulnerabilities and weaknesses. So it was partially an unknown quantity. And the parts of the machine that were known, um, you know, early on were troubling. Dan, just like the other computer scientists, was a bit of a stuntman. And in the public hearings uh, for um, the uh, purchasing of the machines, he got up from the dais, walked across the hearing room, you know, opened up the latch on the back of the machine and pulled out the memory card and waved it around for the newspapers, uh, photographers who were clicking and said, this is where the votes are. You know, this can be attacked. This can be hacked. This can be stolen. Um, and it was just the kind of... St- that made local election clerks furious. And it wasn't long before uh, Dana DeBevoir, the clerk of Travis County, and Dan, the computer scientist, were going to war um, in local newspaper features in which you know, reporters, this was around 2004, were starting to listen to the computer scientists and ask, hey, are these guys right? You know, are these machines really insecure? One key feature about DREs um, that your listeners should know is, is that these were machines that kept track of the vote tally electronically only. So oftentimes there was not a paper backup. If you know the machine, uh, you know, uh, malfunctioned or short circuited. Not that that often happened, but in theory those votes would be lost. You know, they existed only on the machine and only uh, on these memory cards. And it made running programs that could. Again, theoretically, there's never been any evidence this has ever actually happened, but in theory made it quite easy uh, for an advanced uh, hacker or an advanced persistent threat, as they're sometimes known, to do all sorts of uh, mischief. And the reason we know this is because these computer scientists who were good guys, often from uh, academia or universities, had sort of a taste for the theatrics. So, you know, famously... um, they would hack voting machines and turn them into Pac-Man arcade games, or they would hack voting machines um, and swing the election for uh, you know, a, a new candidate, Benedict Arnold. And there's at least one case where um, one uh, professor at the University of Michigan enlisted some grad students to hack the real life voting machine of Washington, DC, so that every time you voted, it would play the University of Michigan fight song. Um, so these were things that you could do on network machines that didn't have you know, the, the level of uh, security or uh, the security protocol that in the computer science community um, was thought to be um, sort of the high bar that needed to be cleared on any system, on a home computer system, much less for something that the public was going to be voting on. And that clash was distilled, you know, compressed in pure form right in the middle of Texas between the Rice University professor, Dan Wallach, and, and the clerk, Dana de Beauvoir. Okay, to step back here quickly before we go to break, when you're doing things all electronically, you can have something that is 100% anonymous or you can have something that is really easy to verify after a ballot has been cast. Why is doing both of those things so much harder? Right, so the short version is that America didn't always used to vote the way we vote. For the first 100 years, we voted in crowds. People would show up to the sort of town square and there would be a clerk there taking names and you would vote right in front of your friends and your family. The reason that we don't do that anymore is we had a tremendous problem with party machines in the late 1800s. You know, uh, you might remember Boss Tweed and Tammany Hall and a rampant corruption problem of vote buying. So to solve this problem of people buying votes and selling votes, we invented this thing called the secret ballot. And the result of that is that, uh, 
my ballot, your ballot, every American's ballot is anonymous. And what we traded off when we went into this anonymous system was that we could no longer verify whether the ballot was counted correctly. That's the devil's bargain we made 100 years ago and a problem that computer scientists would try to solve 100 years later. Journalist Benjamin Wofford is a contributor at Wired. We're talking about his recent article, A Texas County Clerk's Bold Crusade to Transform How We Vote. Funding for the Think Podcast comes from the UT Dallas Jindal School of Management Global Leadership MBA, ranked number one for best online MBA by CEO Magazine. Spring 2021 semester applications are open. Details at glemba.utdallas.edu. This is Think. I'm Chris Boyd. My guest this hour, journalist Benjamin Wofford, is a contributor at Wired and recently published an article called A Texas County Clerk's Bold Crusade to Transform How We Vote. We should say, Ben, this story takes place in Texas, but it's not a Texas-specific story. In fact, it goes back to the late 80s when you had this grad student at Yale who has two great loves in this life. He loves math and he loves politics. Tell us about Josh Beneloa. So Josh Benelow uh, is a young uh, math student getting his PhD, and he's intrigued by this problem of voting. The problem is, how do you bridge this divide, this canyon between secrecy and verifiability? You know, when we cast our vote anonymously, it slips into this black box of faith and conviction. When all of us look on election night up at the screen and see the big tally for Donald Trump or Joe Biden, most of us are thinking, well, I, I think my ballot's in there. I assume my ballot's in there. And we've built a protocol around casting that ballot to uh, you know, give a, a boost to our sense of trust. But because we don't ever truly know what happens to our ballot because of its anonymity, we can never verify it. And Josh Benelow was trying to solve this problem. Would there be some way mathematically to bridge these two different values? And he stumbles upon this paper that uh, basically describes a a really obscure um, effect in encryption, uh, a famous kind of encryption called RSA. And this effect would be called homomorphic encryption, sometimes known as homomorphic cryptography. And basically what Josh realized was that uh, deep in the language of uh, multiplication and addition, was a common grammar. And if you understood this basic fact, you could take encrypted values and add them together and create encrypted sums. So just to clarify what that means, it would mean if I took the encryption of the number two and I took the encryption of the number four and I added them together, the result would be a new encrypted thing. And the result would be the encryption of the number six. Two plus four is six. And this might seem, and in fact, it did seem sort of like an odd coincidence that didn't really matter much uh, in the real world, except with one, and perhaps only one, perfect use case. And that was the problem of voting. Because what voting is, really, is one really big addition problem. You vote for Donald Trump. Someone else votes for Joe Biden. We add up all the Trump votes, and we add up all the Biden votes. And we get to a sum. But in the process of getting to that sum, we have to make sure that everybody's ballot is anonymous. Because if it weren't, we would be stuck back in the 1800s, where people could buy and sell their votes rampantly. And that was a huge corruption problem in American history. So with this idea of homomorphic cryptography, you suddenly had a way to bridge the divide between secrecy, the secrecy of the vote, and verifiability, the verifiability that the vote was counted as cast. And it also opened up a whole number of interesting possibilities that would effectively transform the voters' experience of voting uh, along the way. So for people who are like trying to follow along at home, and this sounds really complicated, the, the upshot is you could create a system where this um, sort of encrypted result, everybody who casts a ballot gets some kind of paper receipt that they can then go online later and sort of check against the computer records? Exactly. So so here's the idea. If your ballot is encrypted, but it can still add, right, then you can see 
the result of your vote, you know, on a billboard on, it could be an actual billboard. It would be huge. Or it could be a billboard that, uh, you know, a cork board that exists online where you could take your ballot home and see your ballot in the pool of the ballots that were counted. And for the first time, Americans could say, hey, there's my vote. And it was counted. And because my receipt matches the encrypted gibberish on the ballot in the pool, I can be confident that it was counted as cast. To understand sort of the reverse of this problem, before this breakthrough, the homomorphic encryption breakthrough, there's where the problem would have started. It's not enough to just encrypt your ballot, right? Because encryption is just like putting your paper ballot in a lockbox. Imagine if you took your, your paper ballot and you stuck it in a lockbox and you, you know, threw away the key. Well, you were sort of stuck because you can't really count a ballot that's trapped in a lockbox. And you certainly can't add 10 other people's lockboxes together. Homomorphic cryptography was a way to add things that couldn't be seen together. And once you could do that, you could unlock um, a, and a, a whole suite of really interesting ideas that would enhance the democratic experience. The biggest of which was that you'd have a receipt. You could go home and see that your vote was counted. But another one, almost as big, is that because the code that would run these programs would be open source, you could actually verify that the tally that's using this branch of math called homomorphic cryptography was correct. And so in theory, you know, uh, Chris or Ben, we could write these programs ourselves if we had a you know, PhD in math, which we don't. But civic groups like the League of Women Voters or the Wall Street Journal or the Republican National Committee could write these verifier programs and distribute them to their voters. And on election night, you, me, or anyone could run these programs on an app in our, on our phone and actually run the math and verify that the winner of the presidential election actually is the winner of the presidential election. And so once you bridged this divide between secrecy and verifiability, there were all sorts of new things that you could do um, that the analog version just simply wouldn't have allowed. And it's sort of a utopian vision of what democracy could look like. So it's not that this new kind of system would be impervious to hacking. It's that if somebody hacked it, you'd know pretty much right away. That's exactly right. So um, let's not get this uh, notion of verifiability confused with perfect security. It just makes the point of hacking seem a whole lot less appetizing, right? So say you wanted to swing 30,000 votes from you know, Joe can't Joe the candidate to Bill the candidate, right? The problem with that is if you don't want to get caught, you will know that the votes have been swung probably within a few minutes, right? If every voter can go home after they vote and they drop their kids off at school and they go home and they log online and see that their vote doesn't match, we'll know right away that there's a problem. We'll know before lunchtime that there's a problem with the vote. So it affords a kind of perfect knowledge. But there's a trade-off here, and it's worth, uh, you know, an important um, point, and it's a point of debate, which is, you know, knowledge can be a curse, right? And so, uh, if malefactors or bad guys aren't really interested in swinging the result, they're just interested in causing chaos or confusion. Perfect knowledge is a dangerous thing, right? Um, it might be the case that there are bad guys who want to delete, uh, you know, who knows. Uh, two or 3,000 votes, not enough to change the election, but just to cause an outcry before we might not actually know whether two or 3,000 votes were deleted. We'd really rely on the Department of Homeland Security to tell us something like that. But now we will really be in charge of our own destiny and know that fact. So with great power comes you know, great responsibility and uh, you know, the, no the knowledge afforded by this technology um, you know, could have consequences. And um, the question of whether we're ready to take that step, I think, is a really interesting one. Okay, so this all sounds very promising. Um, it seems like once you know what's needed, you just build it and move on. What did it take for Dan Wallach, that guy who had been um, such, uh, such a bother <laughs> making his, uh, his criticisms uh, to Dana de Beauvoir, what did, what did it take for him to build a prototype? Right. So all of this math is uh, what comes out of the mouth of Josh Benelow, the, the Yale researcher, and he approaches Dan Wallach and also Dana and says, I've got this amazing idea. 
and against sort of the odds, these two enemies, the clerk and the scientist, decide they're going to team up and try to build this thing. And they give it a name. They call it Starvote. And when word gets out about Starvote, this zany new idea, homomorphic what? You know, people are sort of dazzled by the prospect of reinventing voting for the first time in 100 years. It is a categorical change in the way we'd vote. And some of the best technicians and scientists flew in, actually from all over the world, right into Austin um, in the county clerk's office for these various sessions that took place uh, during the summers of 2012 and 2013. And they worked up a design for something that would uh, do the homomorphic procedure, would allow people even with a, a high school grasp of computer science to verify the outcome of the election. It was pretty radical stuff. The problem was, how would they get it built? Their first step was that they wanted to see if they could publicly own the source code and publicly own the product, right? The idea was, remember early on, these clerks feel trapped by a very small private sector um, that are doing the best they can, but nevertheless building these machines that computer scientists feel are insecure. Could they break free of that? Well, one way would be to publicly own, uh, sort of in the way that we publicly own the sewer system, right? Uh, this is sort of sewer socialism. Owned the machines and owned the code. And what you could then do um, sort of the way Linux is an open source program that sometimes people use as an alternative to Microsoft would be to give the technology away for free. And you'd have this sort of liberating revolution of free technology that clerks could then use um, as an alternative to the private sector of voting machines that were often very expensive and, you know, uh, critically um, under engineered in, in some cases. The problem was that very few people had the technical capacity to build something like this. It was also new. It was also weird. People weren't interested in investing a lot of money in something that was so radical. And so once the idea sort of fell apart for public ownership, they went sort of hat in hand to the private sector and found that the private sector also uh, wasn't uh, particularly thrilled or interested in building it either. And so you had this sort of really good example of how an interesting and new innovative idea you know, we think of America as a place where innovative ideas can really thrive, falling between the cracks of, you know, where the private sector fell short and where public ownership in the public sector fell short. It fell in between the cracks of both of these ideas. And what it really required was a big wake up call for the country to take this seriously for either one of those two, the public sector or the private sector, to wake up and actually try to invest in this thing. It, it really would have required a crisis. And a crisis is eventually what, what came. This is Think. I'm Chris Boyd. So when you say big wake-up call, are you talking 2016? 2016 changed the way that policymakers and um, technologists and scientists in the private sectors took uh, voting security seriously. You know, remember this at the top of the hour, this all started with Bush v. Gore. You know, if you talk to the computer scientists who worked in this world for, you know, 10, 15 odd years, it felt to them, you know, as they say in Texas, like hollering down a well, you know, no one would listen. And it was very difficult to convince people that this was anything more than science fiction. Well, in 2016, what felt like science fiction became like science fact and the real possibility and threat um, of networked machines um, or the uh, network security architecture around them, like voter registration databases, for instance, or e-poll books, um, and the software that run them were much more vulnerable than we'd really been willing to admit. And so even though there's no evidence whatsoever that 2016 targeted voting machines or had any effect on swapping votes, and that's been emphatically clear um, uh, with uh, you know every investigation from DHS to the Senate Intelligence Committee, even though this wasn't a problem in 2016 about votes, the idea of a new way to not only count the votes – um, and verify the votes, but also shore up confidence that the outcome of the election really is what we say it is. Because you and I can go home with our receipt and prove that our vote was counted. And you and I, or uh, a civics organization, can write a verifier program that proves that the tally of the votes for president or senator or governor is accurate. The premium on an idea like that really took off in a new way. And one of the companies that got really interested in what they could do in this new world order, this post-2016 America, was Microsoft. And Microsoft comes in with this idea called the Defending Democracy Program. And it's a suite of very interesting ideas. One of the things they do is they guard the servers and monitor server activity 
for incumbents and candidates uh, down to the congressional level as a way to prevent against DDoS attacks and the other type of mischief that we've seen in 2016 and after. And the crown jewel of Microsoft's program was going to be investing in a, 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 a software development kit that could achieve the homomorphic cryptography vision that Starvote had uh, strived for but failed because it fell between the cracks. Um, and it took the muscle and the know-how and the expertise of a company like Microsoft to really get this idea off the ground. Um, and their partnership model is different uh, than what we might expect. Microsoft is not trying to sell a voting machine. They are not getting in the business of uh, buying and selling voting machines or voting technology. They're giving this technology away to that small private sector that we've been talking about that the computer scientists have said, you know, is um, not as accountable as they'd like. Their equipment is, uh, you know, under-engineered, more under-engineered than they would like. Microsoft, in sort of an act of philanthropy, is going to be partnering uh, with those private companies to give this technology to them for free with the hope of having a beta uh, version up and running by 2021. And in theory, um, some elections, you know, coming to uh, 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 elementary school gymnasium near you uh, as soon as 2022. I don't understand entirely why these private vendors didn't want to build this stuff in the first place with this new technology, because if you're scaling this across, I would imagine it's it's thousands or even tens of thousands of machines that are needed across the country. That seems like big money for them. It's a perfect question. Um, so this is an issue that uh, is getting more attention, and, and it's the economics and sort of market incentives of the very small private sector that manufactures voting machines. Um, those incentives are becoming clearer with the uh, with some really interesting work um, by a team of researchers out of the Wharton School, the Wharton Business School at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, they've got a report coming out later this year that's actually looking at the price structure of how these voting uh, co technology companies actually make profits. These are privately owned companies. They're incredibly small. They, as far as we can tell, um, have profit margins that are almost equivalent of fumes. I mean, they're incredibly thin profit margins. And they're each all three owned by uh, the private equity industry. And so it, it, it's really eye-opening to consider whether or not um, the experiment in um, how we actually administer democracy and its marriage with the private sector um, is really an experiment that um, – is deeply complicated and, and certainly has um, uh, its share of critics. My guest is journalist Benjamin Wofford. He wrote recently for Wired about a crusade to transform the way Americans vote, keeping votes both verifiable and entirely anonymous. listening to Think. I'm Chris Boyd, speaking this hour with journalist Benjamin Wofford, a contributor at Wired, who wrote, wrote recently about a Texas county clerk's bold crusade to transform how we vote. If you've got a question, you can call 1-800-933-5372 or email think at kera.org. That's where we hear from Larry, who wants to know about good old-fashioned software bugs that could lead to incorrect results in elections. Larry says, we've all seen bugs in the software we use every day, and bugs are common even in the best software. What about that, Ben? Oh, it's a perfect question, and um, Larry deserves a lot of credit for asking, because, you know, this is not a program uh, that Microsoft, the Microsoft um, uh, um, program is called Election Guard. And it's not a, a guarantee that uh, the machines uh, that um, run digitally are secure. It's only a guarantee that we have visibility into how our votes are counted. And so actually, um, if anything, what this project is doing is raising the stakes on making sure that um, you know we have a robust security protocol, and 
the you know number one thing that uh, the Microsoft programmers, including Josh Benelow, who is the godfather of um, this idea, says is we don't know how to build bug-free code. You know the Pentagon is designing fighter jets that can't run on bug-free code. Um, you know we see it all the time. You know there is um, you know a shift that's going on in American democracy that I think ought to give us um, some. Uh, cause for optimism. You know, after 2016, there was a wave of uh, a younger generation of people who wanted to run for local government. And I talked to some of these people. One of them is a young woman named Lisa Tolefson in Fulton County, Wisconsin. And this county agreed to allow Microsoft to come in and test the election guard protocol. It was the first test um, ever run using homomorphic cryptography in a tiny election for the local school board. I think 300 people or so voted. And when I asked uh, the clerk, uh, Tol Lisa Tolifson, why she had allowed them to do this, she said, well, I'm a different kind of clerk. She came in, was elected in late 2016, and she actually has a degree uh, in industrial technology. She uh, taught microprocessing um, and worked on uh, designing uh, circuit boards and chips at a nearby state university and decided to apply that know-how to becoming a county clerk. And she wasn't intimidated by the technology. She was actually fascinated by it. And the key thing that she understood was that if we're going to take this step where we now have visibility into uh, ex you know, exactly how our vote was counted and exactly the exact knowledge of uh, whether and how it was counted as cast, it's going to raise the stakes on making sure that we're taking all the security measures that we can, whether we're, uh, you know, building um, voting systems and software that, uh, you know, practice the basic security hygiene of red teams and white hat hackers and bug bounties. Um, what that's going to require is a different mindset um, from the private uh, sector companies who manufacture these machines. Or it's going to require new companies, smaller companies, who can come in using Election Guard, which is open source, right, just as the um, sort of utopian dream has always dictated, using that technology to create new uh, voting technology and voting machine companies that actually could take security seriously. So if we're going to have a market-oriented approach to elections, we need county clerks who take the threat seriously, who are educated, and who are thinking just like Larry is, frankly. So it's worth noting, Bill Gates hasn't been running the Microsoft Corporation for some time. About six months ago, he even stepped off its board of directors. But there are some folks on the far right who seem to suspect a lot of his motives. I know there are some people on the far left who worry that the companies that sell these commercially available uh, voting machines um, are are somehow right-leaning. Um, do you think Americans are, are going to accept something that is produced by anyone who has ever made a sort of open political statement? It's such a great question. And I think it's the reason why the big tech companies are really wary about looking like they're getting, you know, overly involved um, in, in elections. Um, the two things I would say is, you know, solutions aren't just things that we do because we're bored. They are things that, you know, are the result of trying to solve a problem. Right. And so in the 1800s, you know, our problem was corruption and vote buying and pa parties that were incredibly powerful. That is not our problem in the 21st century. Our problem is that we have, you know, major candidates for office, one major candidate in particular, uh, you know, Donald Trump, you know, actively saying that, you know, votes are cast illegally, that the vote is going to be rigged. And by the way, as a result, you know, his opponent, Joe Biden, responding that now he's worried that the election could be stolen. So we have a, 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 a democracy at the moment where both major candidates of, of the two parties are suggesting the election could either be rigged or stolen. Um, that's a problem that uh, doesn't look on its face like it has a solution. Part of the solution is a technological side, right? Just like the anonymous secret ballot made vote buying unthinkable, it made the 1800s problem unthinkable. A regime in which you and I can go check our ballot and run the math and prove for mathematical fact that the election was not rigged would make claims of vote rigging also unthinkable. But it wouldn't solve the other side of the problem, right, which is a trust problem. And no amount of technology is going to solve that pixie dust of trust. 
you know, trust in elections is a little bit like Tinkerbell. We all have to sort of believe in order for it to work. And by the way, no town in America knows this more than Fulton, Wisconsin, right, who was willing to let Microsoft come in and try this homomorphic protocol in their town. But in 2016, had 319 votes for Donald Trump and 311 votes for Hillary Clinton. That's a town that's divided among itself, no matter whose technology you're running the election on. So technology won't solve our problems, um, but you know it can go hand in glove with the solution um, if we're willing to take that step in our political culture, maybe. So why can't this be ready for the elections we have coming up a month from now? Well, uh, for one reason, um, is that the approach that Microsoft is taking is um, playing nice with the small private sectors of uh, the election technology companies, which means working backwards basically to attach uh, this, think about it as like a motorcycle sidecar. Mm -hmm. Microsoft isn't building a voting machine, it's building sort of a little sidecar that's going to attach to voting technology. This is voting technology that in some cases is 10, 15, even 20 years old. Right. So they're actually reverse engineering this technology. I don't want to say dumbing it down, but making it compatible with the you know hundreds of different uh, ways that individual counties vote. That's going to take a lot of time. But the second reason is that, you know, it goes back to this problem of how do you overhaul, you know, a system that's this weird Frankenstein marriage between the public and private sector. Clerks don't have money. They buy voting machines, maybe once every 10 or 15 years, right? So, you know, if we're going, you know, unless we have, you know, a national mandate that tells states and counties how they have to vote, which probably maybe isn't such a good idea, but absent that, you're talking about, you know, in theory, if everyone was interested in adopting this, using the system now, and we didn't, you know, give more money to states and counties and just said, when you're ready to upgrade, you can sort of come into this new system. You know, we're looking at, a transition process that happens very slowly, you know, over the next 10 or 15 years. So it actually speaks to how slow change happens um, in this sort of weird, wonky sector of voting machine technology that even in a country that's on the bleeding edge of so much technological innovation in the world, the country, you know, that produced Silicon Valley, we have this one weird pocket of technology, of voting technology, that's still sort of stuck in the medieval ages. All right, let's go to the phones. We have John calling us from Dallas. Hi, John. Hi. Yeah, listen, I, I, there's no question we need to improve our voting technology, but uh, there's all this great software that uh, your guest is talking about. I've never heard of any software that hasn't been hacked. I mean, I mean even the government, uh, the CIA, gets hacked. So... Uh, you know, it's all great, a great plan. It's all, you know, it sounds great, but it, I don't know why it can't be hacked. Do you want to respond to that, Ben? Yeah, it's a great question, and it and it absolutely needs to be taken seriously, right? So, so the the first answer is a theme we've come back to again and again, right? So, the the way, and I know it's hard to believe, and it's hard to describe, you know, really succinctly. Uh, someone once said. Um, trying to explain homomorphic cryptography is like God's work. <laughs> it's, it's, but the point is that you can't cheat math, right? So you can't hack an encryption procedure to, um, to produce an alternate result, right? It's the same reason that you know, um, the world goes round based on encryption. The reason that you know that your credit card statement um, isn't correct and the reason that you know your bank transfer, on the other hand, went through is because encryption, for now, and until we you know, invent quantum computing, which actually might have the computing power to, to, to break encryption for now is, is secure. But your caller's concern is about, you know, a different kind of hacking, which is, you know, uh, hacking that would go in through sort of a, a, another part of um, the attack surface, in which case the uh, election guard procedure would just show you that the results didn't add up, right? It's, um, don't think of it as, as um, you know, as a, as a security system you know, think of it as sort of a smell test, right? This is the kind of thing that can tell you, John, if the election was in fact hacked, right? That's a that's a certain kind of knowledge that that has trade-offs. But let's look for just one second at the other side of this criticism, right? Because all public policy has trade-offs. The other side of this argument, I would say to John, is how is that any different than what we have right now, 
right? The only way that this is different than what we have right now with patchwork systems of ballot marking devices and digital voting machines and highly networked um, electronic systems around e-poll books and, and voter registration databases, right? The only difference now is that if those things are, are hacked or penetrated, it's a matter of great secrecy, right? And so it's actually the, the, the very point that John's concern is correct um, that would lead some people to say, well, yes, let's move to a system where we can know within minutes, in fact, um, if the election were being dickied with or played around with or attacked um, in some way, right? This isn't a way to um, improve security. It's a way to know the truth. Um, and, you know, according to one philosophy, the truth will set you free. According to another philosophy, uh, the truth is like Pandora's box. And, and once, it, once it's out, it can lead to more problems. This is Think. I'm Chris Boyd. All right, Ben, now we're in this place where, uh, in some ways, nobody has to do anything to interfere with polling, with election results. And still, I think a lot of Americans will be suspicious of the result we get in a few weeks. What do we do with this, uh, this, this broad distrust that has been sown among the American electorate? Wow, uh, you know, if I if I had the answer to that, um, you know, I I uh, I'd be uh, you know uh, advising uh, you know both campaigns about uh, how to stave off civil unrest. You know, I think that's the question that everybody's wondering right now. You know, how it relates to an idea like uh, Microsoft Elections Guard program is, you know, um, we don't have to to suffer sort of um, uh, you know or, or toil aimlessly or sort of feel this dread and anxiety, you know, with, with no way out. It will be interesting to see if um, that sense of uncertainty, that sense of anxiety um, pushes Americans uh, sort of over the line to start demanding something better. Look, in the late 1800s and 1880s, 1890s, corruption and vote buying was so rampant um, that, uh, uh, you know, both the, the left such as it was, and the right, such as it was, said, this can't go on. You know, the, the um, trust in democracy um, was too precious, basically, to, um, you know, not look for something better. And, and as it happens, uh, the solution came from Australia. The secret ballot is sometimes called the Australian ballot. You know, there are, are always good ideas to solve your problems. You know, the notion that we just don't know who really won or we can't, you know, be sure that the outcome said what it said is not just an artifact of some candidates, you know, rather irresponsibly sowing doubt in the election when, you know, I just want to be perfectly clear, um, you know, election clerks are the white blood cells of democracy. They run the elections and they are the most trustworthy, upstanding people. I mean, they truly are heroic people. Um, so are the people who build the machines, by the way. They're, they're also patriots. People who get involved in running elections are patriots. They're not just going to let the election be rigged. But the sense of distrust that I think that we're all starting to feel is not just an artifact of, you know, one candidate saying something and sowing doubt. It's also a bigger picture artifact and result of living in a modern world in the 21st century where everything in our lives is verifiable, hmm. you know, from our bank statements to, you know, whether our package uh, from Amazon arrived on time. We can track everything except this one thing, and that's the vote. Um, and that is something that you know, in the vision and dream of Microsoft and the vision and dream of Dana in Texas and Dan Wallach and the computer scientist who started working on this idea 10 years ago is solvable um, with the kind of technology. Whether or not we're pushed uh, to take a new direction is going to, you know, I think have a lot to do with um, what happens in the next six weeks in American democracy. Benjamin Wofford is a contributor at Wired. His recent article was about a clerk's bold crusade to transform how we vote. Ben, thanks for spending this hour with us. Thanks so much for having me. I'm Chris Boyd. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.